Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this Euro ELSO webinar. It's webinar uh, number six, uh, and it's the first pediatric one. So we made it a special one. My name is Peter Ruleveld. I'm a pediatric intensivist from Leiden in Holland, and I will moderate this session. Uh, the topic of today is post-cardiotomy ECMO in children, and is specifically how to identify factors which could improve morbidity and survival. And for this, we have asked a specialist to uh, talk to us about this, uh, this subject. And our speaker of today is Aparna Hoskote, who is a pediatric cardiac intensivist with a long time experience in cardiac ECMO. And she works at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. With her, uh, her uh, enormous uh, amount of experience, <clears throat> uh, I'm sure she will be able to deliver us a very interesting talk uh, and it, the talk will last about 30, 40 minutes, and there's room for discussion afterwards. During the talk, you can enter your questions in the online webinar tool uh, during the entire duration of, of the webinar, so during her talk or afterwards, and I will then relay those questions uh, to Aparne. The entire webinar will be available afterwards, probably from tomorrow, uh, to watch at www.euroelso.net uh, slash webinar, or you can YouTube it and just type in ELSO webinar, and you can find us there. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Aparna uh, to talk to us about postcardiotomy ECMO in children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for this uh, kind introduction. I'm pleased to welcome everyone who has joined into this webinar. Um, what I'm going to be uh, talking about is um, uh, post-cardiotomy ECMO and identifying factors to improve mobility and outcomes. So, so I begin my talk without much ado, and uh, so that we have as many um, questions as possible towards the end. Um, so, I can just let's get this. So I have no disclosures. Uh, I, apart from saying that I am the uh, the chair uh, for the European Society of uh, um, Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care, Espanic Cardiac ICU and Mechanical Circulatory Section uh, Group, as well as I'm in the Scientific Committee for the Euro ELSO, and I look forward to welcoming you all in our next conference in Barcelona very soon. So um, looking at the ELSO registry, January 2018 annual report, you can see that over the last three decades, there's been increasing cardiac ECMO utilization. And this is not only in neonates, but also in the pediatric age bracket. And that is because of more complex surgery and more challenging cases that we are undertaking. However, if you look at the survival in the neonatal age bracket over the last three decades, it has improved from 35% to 47%, an increment of about 12%. But in the pediatric age bracket, it has improved from 39% to 57%, an improvement of 18%. And this is partly due to the fact that we have improvements in perioperative management, but also we have an exit strategy of VAD or ventricular assist device and pediatric transplantation as a exit strategy. So let's look at the incidence of post-cardiotomy ECMO in children. From the published literature that I've listed here, it's anywhere between 2 to 5 percent. Let us look at the subgroup of neonates who need post-cardiotomy ECMO. This is the ELSO Registry International Summary Report from January 2019. And you can see here that the most common congenital heart defect where the children get supported on ECMO is the hypoplastic left heart syndrome with a survival of 43%. The next group is those children who have cyanotic heart disease with decreased pulmonary blood flow, that is tetralogy of fellow, 
double outlet right ventricle and Epstein's anomaly. And there the outcome survival is about 50%. So the survival ranges from 40 to 51% in neonates. If you look at the pediatric cardiac runs from the international summary report, you find that the hyperplastic left heart syndrome is the third common and the survival here is about 46%. So that is better for the overall age bracket from 43 to 62%. So survival of neonates is lower than other age groups. What are the indications for post-cardiotomy ECMO? I have listed a few of the indications here. Failure to wean from bypass, low cardiac output state, unexpected cardiac arrest, disproportional cyanosis, refractory hypoxemia, refractory arrhythmias, and pulmonary hypertensive crises. The indications can also be divided as those needing ECMO in the operating room or in the cardiac theaters for failure to separate from cardiopulmonary bypass, or those needing ECMO after low cardiac output state in the intensive care unit, or those needing eCPR as a form of an emergency ECMO support in the event of a cardiac arrest. Now, what would be the reasons for failure to separate from cardiopulmonary bypass? The most common is myocardial ischemic injury that is related to inadequate myocardial protection. An example would be anomalous left coronary artery from pulmonary artery. Second, increased afterload in the form of outflow tract obstruction pulmonary vascular resistance. An example would be a baby with, with total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, residual shunts, collateral vessels, again, can be an important reason. So it's always very important to exclude anatomical defects. When I look at identifying factors to improve ICU morbidity and survival after post-cardiotomy ECMO, I approach this problem as a a cogwheel, and that is, it's very important that these three cogs are in a wheel together. One is knowledge of risk factors. Second, early diagnosis of the problem. And third, early interventions to optimize recovery. And what I will do in the course of this talk is to go through these three cogs separately, one after the other. So let's look at the knowledge of risk factors. So what are the risk factors that have been published so far? And what are the modifiable factors? Because this is important because we can Now, does timing of ECMO post-cardiac surgery have an impact on the mortality? This is a paper from Gupta et al. published in Pediatric Cardiology in 2016, looking at this factor, whether timing made a difference. They looked at 2,908 children from 42 hospitals in the PHIS database, and they found that there was no impact of timing of ECMO initiation on the outcome, that is survival. You can see here in this graph that they have charted annual ECMO volume and timing for each center in the database. And you can see that the red line represents the weighted fit value between the annual ECMO volume and the timing in, the, in these different hospitals. What they found was that the centers where the annual ECMO volume was high, the time from surgery to ECMO initiation was shorter. But after adjusting for patient and center characteristics, they found that increasing duration of time from surgery to ECMO initiation was not associated with higher mortality or worsening composite poor outcome. Increasing duration of time from surgery to ECMO initiation, however, was associated with prolonged ECMO run, prolonged ventilation, intensive care, and hospital stay. Now let's look at survival, depending on whether ECMO was initiated in the OR, that is in the operating theaters, or in the intensive care unit. Chaturvedi et al. in 2004 published in the Heart Journal 
a series of 100 cases of post-cardiotomy ECMO from our institution, Gridorman Street Hospital, and they found that those who had ECMO from cannulation in OR had a better outcome. However, in contrast, Lafort et al. and Walters III et al. did not find such a result. What they found was that those who were cannulated in theaters actually did poorly. Jagger's et al. and Colliver's, however, did not find any difference in mortality depending on whether one was cannulated in operating room or in the ICU. So what might be the, the speculation here? The feeling was that from uh, those who were cannulated in theaters was that better and optimal support was started right from the beginning rather than waiting for a cardiac arrest to happen. Whereas in those who, who died despite having the cannulation in the OR, uh, one could speculate that they were actually very sick, the surgery was complicated or complex, and that there was a degree, was a degree of myocardial injury or protection. Now, I looked at uh, the PubMed to look at uh, the risk factors which would determine mortality and morbidity in, in the pediatric cardiac age group uh, supported on ECMO. And I found that there were multiple papers right from 1995 to 2004 to, uh, to the ELSO registry data set published in 2016, and, uh, and all these are from big cardiac surgical programs in, in, uh, in the United States, in Canada, and, and there are multiple more such papers published, and this list goes on. So what I tried to do was pick out the top six risk factors for poor outcome after postcardiotomy ECMO in children. The top one, which I think is most important, is the presence of residual lesions. Presence of residual lesions increases morbidity and mortality if not an intervened. So this is a paper from Sick Kids Toronto published in 1995. Black et al. looked at the determinants of success in pediatric cardiac patients undergoing ECMO and they found that, that if there were residual lesions, almost all died, and they concluded that if there were residual lesions, it was almost a contraindication for ECMO. They, however, found that in those where there were no contraindication, sorry, no residual lesions, 70% recovered. Howard et al. found that in their series that 83% had residual lesions, and Agarwal et al. in 2014 found that in their paper that 28% of their patients had lesions identified. And what was important was that that early detection of residual lesions was associated with a better outcome. And you can see here that those who had it early, there were 14 survivors. The survivors are marked by the yellow bar. Um, and you can see that in the late identified group, there were only two survivors. The next important risk factor is acidosis and lactime. What I mean by lactime is the time to clearance of lactate once cannulated onto ECMO. And this is a nice graph from Howard et al. again, looking at post-cardiotomy ECMO in neonates. And you can see here that the survivors had longer time to clearance of lactate and they concluded that unresolved lactate values of more than two millimoles per liter after 72 hours of ECMO support were associated with increased mortality. The third important risk factor is the presence of renal failure. And you can see from the papers listed here, quite a number of publications identified renal failure to be an important risk factor for morbidity and mortality. So much so that Colliver et al. said that patients who received hemofiltration were five times more likely to die. And you can see that the odds ratio is five with a 95% confidence interval from 2 to 11.8. The next risk factor is whether the child has single ventricular repair or a two ventricular repair. 
and it is obvious that those children who had a biventricular repair strategy and were then cannulated onto ECMO had better outcome. Finally, um, coming on to the fifth uh, risk factor was duration of ECMO. Again, a very important factor found in six of these papers outlined here. You can see from this graph that, uh, again, from Howard et al. paper, that there was a significant difference in the ECMO duration in children, in between survivors and non-survivors, whether the children were from a single ventricle anatomy or a biventricular anatomy. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, uh, any 168 hours or seven days was found to be an important cutoff for mortality. And you can see here there's a hazard ratio of two with a 95% confidence interval one to four. And this was statistically significant. The last risk factor, probably not modifiable risk factor, is the presence of prematurity, low birth weight, or chromosomal abnormalities or genetic abnormalities. And again, this was found in quite a number of papers, which are listed here. So now coming back to our original um, cogwheel chart, you can see that we've now looked at the risk factors, we've identified the top six, and now we go on to how do we diagnose if there's a problem and how do we go on to the next step that is intervening. So early diagnosis is important because it reduces morbidity. When I talk about cardiac ECMO, I always think of two important principles. The first principle is appropriate decompression of the heart. It decreases the work, decreases oxygen consumption, decreases wall stress, and aids recovery. So it's very important to prevent distension of the left atrium and, to, and the left ventricle which may in turn lead to mitral regurgitation and pulmonary edema. And there are solutions for this. The second important principle is to identify and diagnose any potential correctable residual lesions. And this is very important because unless this has been done, then success from decannulation and subsequent recovery is not very highly likely. So how do we diagnose and manage res any residual lesions? The most common that we use is transthoracic echo. However, the presence of an open sternum, dressings, and the cannula position can obscure echocardiographic windows. Transesophageal echo is also a potential way to identify any problems. However, concerns are patient size, Acuity, a very sick patient, the ECMO patient is a sick patient, risk of trauma to the upper GI tract in an anticoagulated patient. And also remember that flow through the aortic cannula may produce or exacerbate aortic insufficiency, which means that this has to be borne in mind whilst interpreting flows and gradients. Early cardiac catheter is an important diagnostic tool. Studies have shown that those who received earlier catheterization and then re-interventions of cardiac surgery were more likely to survive. In the cardiac cath lab, you can do a diagnostic and an interventional assessment. One can assess the operative result as well as find out hemodynamic pressures and an assessment. And also, then interventions can be done, such as left heart decompression, or catheter-based interventions such as stent placement or arrhythmia mapping and ablation in the case of a recalcitrant arrhythmia. Also, I'd like to highlight that sometimes we may discover cannula issues. And I give you here an example of a three-month-old child who was admitted to our unit with double inlet left ventricle, the transposition of great arteries, who underwent an arch reconstruction a DKS, that is Damus Kiel stem cell surgery, and this was a single ventricle pathway for this baby. The child, unfortunately, had severe pulmonary hypertension in theaters on 
coming off bypass and had to be cannulated for ECMO in theatres. The child was supported in our ICU and then we, we took the child down to cat lab for an assessment. What we found here, you can see from the arrow, is that there were significantly high elevated pulmonary artery pressures. They also looked at the arch and fortunately there were no there were no abnormalities identified there structurally. However, when they did the pullback arch uh, gradient, they found that there was a pullback gradient from the ascending to the descending aorta. And this was a significant gradient. And this was most likely related to the aortic cannula. So this child returned back to the ICU. In time was converted to a neck cannulation, more time was given on ECMO for cardiac rest and recovery, when the hypertension treatment was intensified and then was successfully decannulated. This is another example of a child on our unit who had a residual VSD, and you can see here that the echo, uh, sorry, the the um, echo is not playing, but what, what the echo is showing is a residual VSD. And you can see here that the echocardiographic data, the cath data, and the ICU findings led to this child having an intervention in the form of surgery, and the child then came off ECMO. So when we compare methods of assessment and interventions post going on to ECMO, the booth at our paper published in 2002 shows that 84% of their patients had cardiac catheter and 20% had residual lesions on echo and more than 50% had a re-intervention. Al-Gawal et al. showed that 20% of their patients had residual lesions on echo. However, on the catheter, 78% had residual lesions and 81% of those went for a re-intervention. Again, Nicholson et al. showed that 40 to 50% have re-intervention in theater and 40% have intervention in cath lab after cardiac surgery. So it's important to identify residual problems and to correct them. And in this, cardiac catheter is more sensitive, uh, leading to a high rate of re-intervention for residual lesions. So cardiac catheter on ECMO is an important diagnostic tool for patients with a failing circulation requiring ECMO support. Cardiac catheter should be considered early in the ECMO run to facilitate correction of residual lesions as well as to support the failing myocardium with left heart decompression when indicated. Of course, there can be risks in taking this child on ECMO, maybe with an open chest down to the cat lab. However, if done in experienced hands, cat can be catheters can be safely performed. So now we move on to the third cog in the wheel, and that is interventions to optimize recovery. So coming back to the two important principles that I mentioned earlier, the first was the appropriate decompression of the heart. And as I said earlier, it's very important because it aids recovery. If the left atrium and the left ventricle get distended, there is mitral regurgitation, and then that leads to pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema is not a good sign because the lungs then get affected, and then you have to give time for the lungs to get better. So there are interventions that can be done, and that is you know, balloon atrial septostomy or a surgical left atrial mm -hmm. vent. And we'll talk about this um, shortly. So every effort should be made to ensure adequate flow and oxygen delivery during ECMO. Any residual anatomic lesions are often present and should be identified early as delay is associated with mortality. It's very important to rest the heart well with adequate decompression and will reduce afterload and will help the heart. And adequate decompression in a post cardiotomy situation is ideally done by placement of a left atrial vent or sometimes with balloon atrial septostomy. 
I emphasize again that it's important to ensure adequate flow and oxygen delivery because we all know that high lactates in the run or inotropic requirement in the ECMO run are poor prognostic signs for survival. And this is because if you don't have adequate ECMO flows, then the clearance is impaired. Left ventricular heart decompression facilitates adequate venous drainage. It optimizes ECMO flow. It prevents over distension and injury of the systemic ventricle, and it reduces left atrial hypertension and the pulmonary edema. And in turn, it can reduce ECMO duration and thus any potential for ECMO-related complications. These are a few X-rays which I have put up here, which show a pulmonary edema which has improved after left atrial decompression. And you can see here that the left atrial pressures can be extremely high uh, in the setting of a dilated distended left ventricle, which is very poorly ejected. So let's talk a little bit briefly about ECMO in single ventricle physiology. There's always a big debate in the context of the BT shunt following stage one palliation. Should we leave it open or should we leave it closed? There are some centers which leave it open and there are some centers which leave it partially closed. Jaggers et al. published in their paper that all those who have the shunt occluded die. We also know that those who have shunt which is left open, there will be chances of delayed lactate clearance and poor systemic perfusion unless you have very high ECMO flows. And, and what we find is that in children who have the BT shunt open, and if they then start having poor lactate clearance, then it's important then it is partially clipped. And this is the approach taken by quite a few centers, uh, not only in our institution, but also in Texas and in Boston. The other approach could be that you leave the shunt open but have extremely high flows. And this is to sort of you know, make up for both the pulmonary and the systemic circulation in the stage one norbert. And this is a paper from Botha et al. published in 2016, where the authors present a very high flow situation which mitigated the need for having the shunt surgically Closed. They maintained very high ECMO flows at four hours and at 48 hours, and you can see here this was significant. And they had two groups of patients in their study population, the ones with shunt and ones with the RV to be 100. And you can see that there was delayed lactate clearance in the shunt group, and this was significant. The presence of shunt, neonatal age, peak lactate, eCPR, and the use of hemofiltration and ECMO significantly predicted the rate of clearance in this group. So, so the second thing that I want to mention in single ventricle physiology patients who are supported on ECMO, that is the indication for ECMO is very important. If it is hypoxemia versus hypotension, the ones who are cannulated for hypoxemia have a much higher chance of survival compared to the ones who are cannulated for hypotension. This was seen from this paper uh, published in 2007. And you can see here that, um, that those who had, um, those who, were, those, uh, who had um, shunt occlusion had much higher survival. And the indication for hypoxemia were the ones that survived as compared to the ones who were cannulated for hypotension. Dr. Brown, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, wrote this review article looking at the outcomes following ECMO in children with cardiac disease uh, and listed all the factors associated with worse outcome. And you can see here that there are multiple factors, including long bypass time, the need for ECMO initiation early, presence of arrhythmias prior to ECMO, multi-organ failure, cardiopulmonary resuscitation comes up again 
and the duration of ventilation prior to ECMO and ECMO duration as well. It's also important to remember that complications on ECMO are associated with increased morbidity and mortality. From our own paper um, published in 2006 uh, from the study done in Toronto, um, we found that those neonates who were cannulated as rescue ECLS had poor survival for, on, in the Kaplan-Meier survival curve over time. And you can see that it is 32% versus 48%. So what is the longer term outcome of these children? And you can see that from this paper published in um, JTCVS in 2013, the short term and medium term and survival of these patients is 73% and 66% over time. And this is very important to remember that there is attrition. So there is attrition from the time of decannulation to hospital discharge to subsequent uh, intermediate and long-term survival. Um, you can see here that this paper looking at complications during ECMO run found that any complication was statistically significant in predicting mortality. It's important to highlight here that we must minimize complications. It is the complications that worry us most are brain injury in the form of CLS bleeding, lung injury uh, in the form of uh, pulmonary hemorrhage uh, or um, widespread atelectasis. So it's very important that we adequately decompress the heart. We reduce uh, afterload um, with the use of vasodilators. We reduce the, um, any fluid overload we support the renal function with CDBH if need be. We monitor the liver function. Um, we also continually monitor the brain. And we must also remember to continually review the patient condition with the help of a multidisciplinary team approach. It's very important for us to be vigilant for every opportunity to come off. I'd like to highlight here that whilst we are focusing on the heart, we should not forget the lungs. It's very important to look after the lungs. We can see again from the same paper published in JTCVS, we can see here that as lung, lung compliance was an important predictor of mortality. And if it got worse, then the chances of survival were poor. So I say, look after the lungs well. So to summarize and coming back to the cogwheel approach, first, it's important to be aware of the risk factors. We need to prevent, we need to identify um, the right diagnosis and have the right surgery. We need to anticipate and preempt any difficulties in the preoperative stage so that we can be prepared for any complications post-op. Low cardiac output state should be identified early and early institution of ECMO before cardiac arrest. Early diagnosis is important once the child's cannulated on ECMO. Evaluate till you're certain that there are no residual lesions and ensure that the heart is well decompressed so that it will rest and recover. Investigate with echo and catheter to identify any residual lesions. Finally, what are the interventions to optimize recovery? To summarize, optimize ECMO flows, adequate decompression, reduce afterload, reduce fluid overload, support the renal and the liver function, continually review and, and, and you know, conduct MDTs. It's very important to anticipate it would be better for this child not to be in post-cardiotomy ECMO situation because we know of the complications that arise from being on ECMO support in the immediate post-operative period, particularly related to bleeding. So if there is a if there are any situations, then we should preempt and we should identify those children who are at high risk for need of ECMO in the post-operative period.
Example of this would be an obstructive TAPVD presenting in shock, alkapa, with poor myocardial function. Any complex cardiac condition you know, in a univentricular tract pathway, any technically challenging surgery. So, it's, so in the preoperative period, it's important to preemptively discuss, note as high risk, ensure ECMO backup. The surgeons may sometimes leave purse strings and have the perfusion maintained on standby. Avoid at any cost a catastrophic cardiac arrest. So here, I would like to say a word about eCPR. Good quality CPR is extremely important to ensure a good outcome from eCPR. This is a survey of um, eCPR in the pediatric cardiac population in search of a standard of care. And what's interesting from the graphs here is that the authors noted a wide variability in resuscitative practices during eCPR in the pediatric cardiac population. They also found that there were significant deviations from the established PALS CPR guidelines. An effective eCPR program requires trained expert staff who are fully equipped to commence extracorporeal life support efficaciously in the minimum time possible. Whilst maintaining good quality CPR with minimal interruptions to chest compressions during the low flow phase. A successful eCPR program needs education and training, anticipation and activation. And underpinning all this is having appropriate resources. What we do in the intensive care unit is important even for the future. This is a study published in 2012 in the PCCM looking at quality of life of pediatric cardiac patients who previously required ECMO. In a study number of 41 patients using a quality of life instrument, what was found was that prolonged length of stay in the CRCU and hospital were associated with low physical summary scores. This is another paper uh, looking at the two-year survival, mental and motor outcomes after ECMO support at less than five years of age. And in a study group of 39 children, the survival was 46% with some attrition and going down to 41% at two years. All children had neurodevelopmental follow-up and what was found was that the risk factor for death at two years was the lack date on admission to ICU and single ventricle anatomy. Interestingly, the multiple regression model showed that 76% of the variance in mental score was attributed to the time for lactate to normalize on ECLS. The highest inotrope score is in hours ECLS and any chromosomal abnormality. So I'm coming towards the end of my talk and thinking of the modifiable factors that I referred to earlier in the presentation, what are the take-home messages? So the take-home messages are anticipate and be prepared. Avoid cardiac arrest in an eCPR situation if at all possible. Once on ECMO, maintain good flows and effective support and look after the end organ function. Identify early any hemodynamic issues or any residual lesions. It's very important that this is done as soon as possible. And if identified, then it's intervened as soon as possible too. So as I said, early re-interventions once diagnosed. Effective and early decompression to rest the heart and to promote recovery. Prevent and treat any complications. Most importantly, and the most common complications of bleeding, renal failure, and neurological complications. Look after the lungs, don't forget. Be vigilant to come off ECMO at any time. I always say this, that together, everyone achieves more. Success for the postcardiotomy ECMO patient doesn't just rely on 
the ECMO team. It is a cohesive approach that is important and you need not only cardiology, interventional cardiology, surgery, perfusion, ICU nursing, ECMO nursing, as well as the follow-up team. With this, I thank you all for listening and I acknowledge um, my gratitude to the patients, families, colleagues and staff at Great Ormond Street Hospital and friends elsewhere who have been an inspiration for this talk. We look forward to welcoming you in Barcelona soon. The conference is from 10th to 13th April next month. So we would be very happy to see you there. And I thank you all once again for participating in this webinar. I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Aparna, this was brilliant. Thank you very much for a, um, a very concise, very uh, smoothly delivered talk on a, a very uh, important topic that we're all uh, that we all care about. Um, slowly, some questions are dripping in, um, so I would like to urge everybody who does have a question for Aparna to to ask them now. Now you have a chance, or you have to come to Barcelona, which is even better. Uh, maybe, and we can talk about uh, uh, for a, uh, a longer period of time. Um, I want to go through the, uh, the stages a little bit uh, systematically. Um, there's a few questions here that I want to reserve for a little bit later, um, but I have a question for Aparna um, uh, concerning um, how decisions are often made. Um, I find it difficult. Uh, uh, I know when the next step is going to be. I know I need to do a, a, a catheter, um, but when do we do the catheter? You say as soon as possible, but what do you mean by as soon as possible? So Peter, thanks for this question. Um, and I think, um, as I said earlier in my presentation, uh, a good outcome is underpinned by a multidisciplinary team approach. And, and I think as soon as a patient is, um, has been cannulated and is supported effectively uh, on ECMO, I think the team should get together to identify what might be the reason for this child needing ECMO and, and then to, to investigate thoroughly. Uh, mm -hmm. If it is done in a multidisciplinary team approach, uh, within the first 12 to 24 hours, I think, um, that's when uh, the, you get the greatest mileage in a successful outcome for the patient. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, that's correct. But I, I find it sometimes we, we, we tend to sometimes give children a chance to settle in or recover a little bit on ECMO before we do any, uh, inter uh, any further investigation. But now and again, I more and more want to go quicker than that. If as soon as I don't understand, try and get the team together and try and convince them that, uh, and, and all discuss and try and find the best time to to look at residual lesions because I think that's one of the most important things that we can actually yeah, modify. One other question that I that 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 comes to mind is is uh, you 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 speak about the amount of flow. Uh, yeah, we have to uh, give adequate flow, and we'd like to see the lactate uh, uh, normalize as soon as possible. And you mentioned one paper which clearly stated that if the lactate doesn't normalize by 72 hours, the uh, the outcomes are worse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you wait 72 hours for your lactate to normalize? Um, I don't think that should be the case. I think what they found in their study was the where the lactate took a longer to normalize, they were associated with poor outcome. But I think it's uh, imperative that we identify why the lactate is not coming down. We also are aware that you know, sometimes uh, lactate is often elevated very significantly before ECMO deployment, and that is because of inadequate organ and tissue perfusion. But once you cannulate on ECMO and you restore output with mechanical support, then the lactate should normalize. Uh, 
An unresolving lactate means that you need to identify what the reason for that is uh, and, and you know, approach it in the form of either augmenting the flows, trying to see if the endorgan function, particularly liver dysfunction, is, is okay or not. And, and, then, and then sort of, you know, try and get to the bottom of it. I think waiting is definitely not in the best interest of the patient. How much flow do you do you start off with at GOS? I think our flows are usually commensurate with the high flows, anywhere between 100 to 150 mls per kilo per minute, and based on a cardiac index of at least 2.4 liters per meter square. Okay. And what I'm guided by is the level of systemic, the markers of systemic perfusion once on such flows. So is the um, extremal saturation in the range that I want it to be? Is there good adequate flow reduction? Are the flows good? And uh, what's the, the circulation? What's the peripheral perfusion? And I think these factors guide me more than an actual number. Thank you very much. This 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 ties in with a couple of questions that are that are that are coming in. So once we have a child on ECMO and we run a certain flow and we we know what's going on they need some time to recover but then what what do you do to uh, and what do you aim for uh, uh, in blood pressure wise do you use something to titrate blood pressure do you have minimal uh, goals that you go for that are different in ecmo than on a child not on ecmo for blood pressure so that's a very important question on VA ECMO, we know that there is systemic hypertension. It's very common to see systemic hypertension, and the causes for that are many, including the fact that there's significant afterload in the form of the cannula. You also have non-pulsatile flow uh, going to the kidneys with increased renin activation of the renin angiotensin system. So there is definitely systemic hypertension seen. Reducing afterload and using antihypertensives is very important to improve ECMO flow. Our targets usually are, um, I would say, uh, slightly lower than the age-related age, um, norms. And, and I think also, again, we wouldn't go by a particular number, but we would go by seeing what is the degree of afterload reduction that is needed and uh, what are the markers of systemic perfusion with the flows and adequate uh, after reduction to guide it. Yeah, thank you. I think that, that, that you're absolutely right. It's so much more than just treating a number. It's the entire patient that we're looking after. And uh, yes, thank you for the, for the answer. I'm just looking to the, to the questions there. Um, somebody asked, if, if you have, do you ever need to use noradrenaline? to titrate blood pressure or is that a big no or a big yes? No, um, sometimes you need to use noradrenaline in say a situation where you have like a vasoplegic shock and sometimes you do see that where you have a cardiotomy ECMO patient but may, there might be an element of like sepsis or there's significant vasoplegia with severe vasodilatation and you may have to use noradrenaline. We also see that uh, in uh, children who have been bleeding, and whilst you are um, trying to correct blood, uh, you know, blood bleeding diathesis and giving blood and blood products, that you might need to use a little bit of noradrenaline whilst uh, the bleeding gets under control. So yes, we do use noradrenaline uh, in the beginning uh, of the ECMO run, uh, or if there is sepsis. However, whilst you are trying to come off ECMO, so in the weaning phase. Um, you wouldn't use any vasoconstrictor, because, you know, especially if there is impaired left ventricular function, because you want to try and minimize um, uh, any, any afterload for the ventricle. So you want to have yeah. as little afterload and you want to improve contractility of the left ventricle to see that you can come off at more. Yeah, exactly. Because I've got questions coming in about, the, this is always a discussion, um, whether or not to use inotropes while on cardiac ECMO. What's your opinion on? Oh, that's a very, very interesting question. Ideally, ideally, if uh, the ECMO flow is sufficient and it's adequate to meet the oxygen, oxygen demand, then you really don't need any inotropes. Uh, 
However, there are certain situations where if the left ventricular decompression is not very good, then the aortic valve closes and, you know, there is, you know, non-pulsatile flow on, or no ejection on the arterial trace. Yeah. In that uh, situation, you need to decompress the heart and you need to promote some left ventricular contraction. In those situations where after you've decompressed, you may use a little bit of noradrenaline to keep that going. But again, I would uh, say a word of caution here. I wouldn't use high dose of inotropes um, because we know that um, high dose of inotropes are not really good. They increase uh, myocardial oxygen consumption and you really want to give the best chance for this heart to recover. And therefore, uh, whilst you're fully supported on ECMO, you want to minimize anything that can you know insult the the myocardium yeah and, and what about levosimendin levosimendin i think uh divided views on that in our institution we don't use levosimendin uh, at all um, but uh, i know that there are certain institutions who use levosimendin and uh, they have found uh, some improvement following that um my uh um, I haven't used it in the context of a post-cardiotomy ECMO. It would come off ECMO. I have not used levosimendin in that context. No, uh, we do, but it's totally um, unsupported by any evidence. So uh, I think uh, there's a, a great idea behind it, but we are yet to to to, to prove that it's actually that it's actually working. Um, so. What we're trying to do is, is support these children as best as we can while the heart recovers or while we deal with the residual lesion. Um, and while we support these children, it's it's important that we provide enough systemic support. So we, you were talking about liver support. Uh, we're talking about the brain, of course. Is there anything else that we can do? Let's talk about the brain to, to, to give better, to give neuroprotection other than providing as much flow as, as, as we can? I think um, one of the things that is not as well studied perhaps is the the transition from low flow to high flow or from low oxygen to high oxygen um, in when you in, initiate ECMO flows. So we all know that these children are hypotensive and maybe hypoxemic and we then suddenly commence them on ECMO, or high flow ECMOs. And there is a transition, and we know that uh, the cerebral autoregulation is impaired in the first few hours of going on to ECMO. And I think trying to increase flows gently and increase um, the oxygen content gently uh, is important in the transition from a low flow to a high flow situation. I think um, to minimize neurological complications, it's very important to be very vigilant. We sadly don't have very effective neuromonitoring tools. Um, we have, of course, the near infrared spectroscopy, which is used quite extensively, but we know that it is not entirely reliable. I think to protect the brain, uh, I think we need to be really very mindful of um, of uh, um, having a sort of a multimodality uh, approach. Uh, need to be examining the patients carefully, looking for information from all the neuromonitoring devices, including EEG, and to, to sort of, um, once identified, to sort of address these situations as soon as possible. Okay, thank you, Aparna. We have about five minutes left, and uh, there's uh, two questions that I'd like to ask you, but they probably both deserve an entire webinar of their own. So. Um, let, well, let's try. Um, one of the question is, um, they're on ECMO, like we said, and they're stable. And one thing that we shouldn't do is do harm. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you do with a ventilator? Um, so um, I think uh, with cardiac ECMO, um, I would say that we have what we call um, as rest settings but they are not like the rest settings for respiratory ECMO. Uh, we do ventilate them. Uh, we, uh, have, um, we have to ensure whilst uh, the heart is recovering that the lungs are maintained and kept well inflated so that come when the heart is ready uh, to be weaned off ECMO, uh, 
that the lungs step in and uh, you know contribute effectively. So so um, ventilation on cardiac ECMO, I would say, is uh, um, it's not entirely uh, you know you totally rest the lung, but you also ensure that there is adequate inflation. We um, have we tend to use in our institution something like um, like 24 on eight, a rate of 20 per minute and an FiO2 of 0.4. Uh, this is just what something we use. Uh, I'm sure other institutions have something similar. But it's important to remember is not to allow that lung to get deflated. We know that in the context of poor ventricular function, the lungs are likely to be congested. So trying to keep them open, trying to keep them well inflated is very crucial come when you want to wean that child of ECMO. Yeah, thank you very much. One last question, uh, which goes back right to the beginning of your of your talk, um, and something that I think a lot of us uh, uh, find difficult, is um, when do you take the next step? We know that uh, a child is deteriorating, and you talked about the initiation of ECMO, either in the operating room or in, in ICU, but that's a sliding scale. And how do you go about at GOS deciding when somebody goes on ECMO? Do you have specific criteria in your institution that may help you? Um, I think uh, it's very difficult to say that there are strict criteria. I think, um, by and large, it's a... Uh, a a decision to be made when you see a child who, who is deviating from the normal post-operative recovery path. Uh, you find that the child is in low cardiac output state, things are not getting better, and you're maximizing your um, support, yet you're not seeing the desired improvement. And I think that's the time one should go in uh, and discuss and prepare for ECMO. I uh, worry about uh, giving uh, any absolute numbers to say that a lactate of X or a mixed venous sat of X is a indicator. Uh, for me, it's the trend that is very important. Once I see a sliding trend, uh, which is not responding to the standard conventional ICU therapies, I start worrying uh, about that child. Um, uh, and I think uh, I would say that's the time when I um, want to step in and start the discussion. Uh, I always believe that um, emergency ECMO is never a good thing. It's not, not good. And it's always better to preempt and go in a sort of semi-elective fashion if um, such a word exists for uh, post-cardiotomy ECMO. Yeah, exactly. Two minutes, so I can slip in just one more. Um, you talked about decompression, that, that's very important. And um, I know that there are units that are uh, advocating uh, to always uh, decompress. Uh, what do you do in your institution? Do you, when do you decide to, to start decom to, to, de to, to decompress a, a left ventricle? <clears throat> I think it's a uh, decision um, that is based on uh, on the findings. Uh, one is um, uh, to say in the beginning, I think our institution is very pro uh, using decompressive strategies. Um, we're very keen. As soon as a patient is cannulated onto ECMO, that's the first uh, discussion that we have with our interventional cardiologists and cardiac surgeons is to, you know, are we effectively decompressing? And, and uh, I think that decision for decompression is based on um, how um, the left ventricle looks on cardiogram. Is aortic valve opening? Is there any ejection seen? Is the left atrium distended? Is there mitral regurgitation? Uh, if we um, uh, if we start seeing, of course, congestion on the lungs on the chest X-ray or uh, I would say pulmonary edema is a very late sign. We, we would have had to have intervened before then. Um, so I think we're very pro. That's our, our uh, institutional strategies, pro decompression. So um, that's our first step is, is we always discuss this.
Thank you very much, Aparna. And um, by this, I want to conclude uh, this, this webinar. I want to thank you very, very much for your very, very clear talk. Uh, I've learned a lot today and uh, many of our attendees have as well. Uh, people have asked questions, people have given you compliments and uh, 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 thanked you for your talk. So on their behalf, I thank you very much. And I hope to all see you either in Barcelona or at the next Euro ELSO meeting in London 2020. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. And otherwise, at uh, coming up, uh, coming webinars uh, in, in, in the future. Uh, so uh, thank you for your attention and uh, have a nice day. Thank you, Euro ELSO, for this opportunity. And thank you, Peter, for this wonderful moderation. Um, I must say it was very smoothly done and I really appreciate all the efforts that people have put in for this webinar. Thank you.